Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hockey News Podcast. I'm Matt Larkin, and Ken Campbell is here, and we wanted to welcome Ryan Kennedy to the 21st century. He's got a new webcam. He's got a new computer. Ryan, how are you feeling, buddy? You're looking, you're looking crisp and clean. Wonderful. It's nice to be out of UHF. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, before we get going, the usual disclaimer applies. If you hear noises in the background, it is my children. I just heard my babies starting to cry. So as I always say, I'm going to keep giving you this, this, this disclaimer every time. It's just the way things go right now. I'll try to talk over it, but this is our life, okay? Uh, so let's talk the big trade. I think in my mind, it's the biggest trade since Shea Weber for P.K. Subban, a true hockey trade, a throwback that you'd see in you know, the 80s or 90s. And it's Pierre-Luc Dubois in a 2022 third-round pick going to the Winnipeg Jets for Patrick Laine and Jack Roslevic. I think we can look at this trade from multiple angles. So let's start with the short term, uh, and then I want to hear the long term. So, Ryan, give me your short and long term winner and loser of the trade. You can give me both back to back. We'll start with you. I, I give the edge to Winnipeg in this trade, even though in terms of value, it was very even. I give the edge to Winnipeg because now they are so deep down the middle with Pierre Luc Dubois there. You know, he doesn't have to be their number one guy. Uh, he was the number one guy in Columbus by a long shot. But with Mark Scheifele there, and then you have Paul Stastny as well, Pierre-Luc Dubois fits in that middle and makes them really potent. They could, they could surrender Patrick Laine because they still have Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers and Blake Wheeler as top six wingers. And of course, you know, they're going to get some, some prospects in there in the, the long term as well. But I look at this where, yeah, you're going to miss some goals from Patrick Laine, but you're going to be better defensively as a team. And you're, you're strong at this, the most important position in the game, at least in my opinion. Whereas with Columbus, I thought they got great value. I mean, everybody knew Pierre-Luc Dubois wanted out. So you didn't have a lot of hand in the situation. But Patrick Laine will help your power play. And, you know, he definitely brings some, some power and, some, and a lot of goal scoring to the lineup. My question is, who gets in the puck. And it's not a matter of him creating for himself. It's a matter of if they don't have possession, he can't score goals. Uh, it seems like Yarmo K. Glyden, the, the GM of the Blue Jackets, uh, believes Jack Roslovic can, can play center in the NHL and, and be good at it. Um, but I just don't see a lot of natural fits in Columbus right now. And I don't see anybody on the horizon unless Liam Foodie becomes that guy in a couple of years. So that's my concern long-term with Columbus is that the, the pieces don't fit as well right now. Yeah, I, I'm actually going to go the other way. I think this trade tilts in Columbus's favor. Um, you know, I get that Pierre-Luc Dubois is a big center who drives possession and, and, I, and I get all that. Uh, but last time I checked, he had two more points than Philip Deneau did last season. Um, you know, I mean, to me, I thought that this trade line a for Dubois one for one would have been a steal for Columbus. But if you throw in Jack Roslovic, I, I think that, I think that, that is, that tilts it way in Columbus's favor, in my opinion. I, I think this is, I, I think, you know, at my first, at first blush, and I've probably, you know, I probably, uh, tempered it a bit but at first blush I was like man they Winnipeg got taken to the cleaners on this one um you know I I just think that you know when you have a chance to land a, a, a prime offensive talent who's capable I'm not saying he's going to but who's capable of being a 50 goal scorer in the NHL which he is he absolutely is um I think you make that trade I think you make it today tomorrow and seven days a week um, to me, I, I just think the upside with Patrick Laine is, is a lot higher than it is with Pierre-Luc Dubois, if we're talking long-term. Short-term, I guess, maybe Winnipeg wins it because Dubois is going to be able to play and Laine isn't for a while. Um, but um, but I, I don't know. I just, I just see a dynamic, dynamic talent who can break games open. And, you know, I mean, I, I worry a bit about Pierre-Luc Dubois in, on the big stage in big games. I know he was great last year against Toronto in the, in the playoff round. He was, he was a beast. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to dispute that at all. However, his, his record in big games has been a bit spotty. Whereas Patrick Laine's record in big games on the international stage, at least has been exemplary. 
Very good points. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with, uh, I think, I guess my opinion kind of mirrors Ken's the most where I see, I see the Jets as a short-term winner. I understand why they're making this trade. I think they're pretty much a win now team right now. Yes. You know, the guys like Mark Scheifele and, you know, Josh Morrissey, they still have a lot of good years left, but with Blake Wheeler, I, I still think part of this core, I, I, you know, especially under the Paul Maurice regime, I, it's time for this team to make progress and they're trying to do something that's going to help them win now. And we know from a team needs perspective, Brian Little's career looks like it's over. Paul Stassi's a UFA next year. They've got their long-term one-two punch up the middle. It gives you flexibility to put Cole Perfetti on the wing. You still have Kyle Connor and Blake Wheeler. You still have also Christian Veselainen eventually coming down the pipeline, who I think now has a better path because he's the type of player that you're going to want eventually to put him in the top six. He's a goal scorer. So now I think it opens up the depth chart for him as well. And even for, you know, for the Jets, it's almost like they weren't going to ever find it with Jack Russell. Like, I don't know whose fault it was, but in, you know, he played 180 games as a jet and he had tw- he averaged 12, 13 of ice time. So I've said it before, it's chicken and egg. I don't know whether he didn't earn Maurice's trust. Maurice never gave him a chance, but it just wasn't going to work anyways. So I get it, but I, I still think long-term, you know, of course, I wrote about this yesterday. A lot of people have said it, you know, if line is going to be Brett Hall, this is going to be the Brett Hall trade. There's no Adam Oates in Columbus. That's a big problem. But if you just look at actual talent, Line A, I think it's going to be the long-term win for Columbus. He's only 22 years old. He's got 140 goals by age 22. He's the fourth fastest player ever to 100 goals, which is insane when you think about you know, the era that he's playing in. Uh, and he's ninth in goal since his career started. It's just a matter of can he get his shot right up. He doesn't shoot enough. And I wrote this yesterday comparing him to Hull. Hull shot the puck a lot more. Line A doesn't shoot the puck as much as you'd think for such a good goal scorer. And he doesn't get as many high percentage chances as you think as he can score from anywhere. So it almost, it's like, it makes him lazy. He can score from so far away that he doesn't always put himself in the high danger, high percentage areas. And if he does that, if he starts to find his game, I think, like you said, Ken, you're going to see those 50 goal seasons. And that that's really like, I was, I was actually reading stuff about Brett Hall. I was reading articles from the eighties yesterday from March, 1988. And that's it. The descriptions are so similar. They're saying, you know, this guy could be a 50 goal scorer. There's potential. He's got to improve his work ethic. He's got to improve his defensive game. And it was like, you're reading about Patrick line. So I get the, the, the potential there. The only thing I, I I'm worried about if I'm, if I'm Columbus is line is an RFA when the season ends, if he gets to play a short season with the blue jackets, with no one passing him the puck, you know, no true great playmaker passing him the puck. Maybe his numbers aren't great. Do we know he's going to be happy? Yes, I know. I know, of course, you know, the contract negotiations have started, but every GM will say that. Um, so I'm curious what happens if we get to the offseason and line is unsigned, whereas Dubois has a year left and he also has his dad who is with the Manitoba Moose, right? So there's more of a pull there for Dubois than there is for line. So I'm curious about that. Um, so keeping on the, on the topic of trades, so these are a couple of big names that were sort of rumored for a while off the board. I want to hear another big name player that you expect to get traded before the end of the season. So Kenny, we'll start with you. Give me a big name. Uh, well, I guess right now I'd have to go with a guy like Bobby Ryan, who's uh, on a very, very, very cheap deal and is, and, and is, is been very, very productive on it. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think any of us is under any illusions that the Detroit Red Wings are going to contend for anything this year. And, and if we were, they were doused this weekend when they got dunked twice by the Chicago Blackhawks. So they're, they're on a road to nowhere. Um, you know, and I know that, I know that, that, uh, Bobby Ryan came there for, you know, because of Steve Eiserman and probably would like to see if there's something long-term that could be worked out. But I mean, if you could, you know, if he's got, if he's still producing at this rate, which he won't be, but if he's still producing at a very, very good rate, you know, by the time the trade deadline comes, you know, I, I don't see why you wouldn't move him for a, for a pick. Mm. I'm going to go to the other side of the continent. I'm looking at somebody in Arizona and I got two sort of ideas. One would be Darcy Kemper. Um, simply because I, you know, I, I don't think the Coyotes are contending this year. I mean, they're off to a very rough start. And this is certainly a, a franchise in transition with a new GM in Bill Armstrong. So, you know, Darcy Kemper has proved himself to be a very good goaltender. Um, even, you know, last year, he was great for them. He could get them a lot of nice assets, including the first rounder that they no longer have uh, in 2021, which would be very crucial. So. I think if they're willing to give up Darcy Kemper, uh, they could get a great package from him. The other name I'm thinking in Arizona is Clayton Keller. You know, this is a young man that looks like he could use a change of scenery. I'm sure there are teams out there that say, 
you know what, in our system, we think we could really get them going. And again, you could get a really nice package, including a first router for Clayton Keller. So that to me would be very intriguing. Yeah, very intriguing, especially because, you know, Keller's got a lot of years left on his deal. So that would be, I assume, like part of a big, one of those hockey trades where, you know, like the Johansson for Seth Jones guys early in their career that they, you know, the team needs to change. Uh, I'm looking at Taylor Hall, of course, you know, pending UFA. It's an obvious pick. And Buffalo, I know, you know, I, I kind of thought it was like, it's cute, the idea that Taylor Hall is going to be, a, you know, staying in Buffalo long term. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, it's And, you know, it's not that I don't think Buffalo is going to improve this year, but that division is devastating. They're already in seventh place. Two, three and one, I think, is the record at the time of recording this podcast. And it's just going to, you know, we we had we picked a, a good team like the New York Islanders to miss the playoffs in that division. So I can't imagine how it's going to work uh, for the Sabers. And I know Taylor Hall; he's got a no movement clause. Uh, but I, 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 my note, I just wrote meh. Like if Hall has a chance to go to a contender, I think he's going to waive that right and, and have a chance at a playoff run. Also, a chance to further up his value in this contract year if he can do some damage in the playoffs. And if this happens, if we get to the scenario where Buffalo is not going to make it, they trade Taylor Hall, then it's like, oh boy, Jack Eichel watch will begin. Because I, I think if the Sabres don't make the playoffs this year, that it's going to be on. I think you could see something like, you know, Eichel, Eichel to Boston rumors will begin, something like that. Uh, moving on now, just looking at the standings, uh, we talked about the Habs a little bit, but I want to talk about them a bit more because everyone's talking about them. Are they the best team in the league right now? It's, it's pretty crazy looking at what they've done so far. They're tied for first overall for, in points with Vegas and Toronto right now. And to me, like, I think they look legit, but I'm curious what you guys think. We'll start with you, Ryan. Are the Habs are, are true Stanley Cup contenders? Is this, is this more than just a blip to start the season? Well, everything's going right for them right now. You know, I mean, we, we came into the season saying, will their young centers be enough? And clearly Nick Suzuki is off to a fantastic start. His very Kotkaniemi is looking very confident up there behind him. Um, so they've got that. Tyler Toffoli has been amazing, uh, you know, bringing him in. The goaltending has been great. The defense has held up. So, you know, unless something changes, yeah, I think the Habs are contenders. They have everything you want uh, in, in a team that can make a run. I, I think the only question – you have is you know this is a sprint of a season rather than a marathon we don't know when the wall hits if there will be a wall for certain players you know I mean in generally in a season you see it kind of two-thirds of the way through uh where you kind of have to push through that malaise um you know the Habs being kind of young maybe that's a benefit for them where you know Nick Suzuki is just because he's a young guy, he's in such a, a great spot right now that he just blazes through the whole season and the playoffs in this high gear, in, in which case you're laughing. Yeah, see, what, to me, I think the fact that it's a sprint <clears throat> is actually going to work in Montreal's favor. I think this is a team that over the long haul, over an 82-game season, I'm not sure how good they would be, but like in a season like this where everything is so uncertain, uh, it's a truncated schedule. You don't know really how many, you know, we, I mean, when it comes down to it, we don't know how many games teams are actually going to play this year. Um, so I think that works in Montreal's favor. Um, are they a legitimate Stanley cup contender? I'm going to say no. Um, for the reason that they've played six games, very good games. They're four Oh and two in a division that does not have a dominant team. They're not going to play a dominant team this year, in my opinion. To me, Toronto is not a dominant team. They're not a true, like, died in the wool Stanley Cup contender along the lines of a Tampa or, a, you know, a Vegas or, well, Colorado has actually been pretty bad so far, but, but you know, those teams. Um, so to me, I think it's, I think a little bit of it is smoke and mirrors. And, and let's not forget, I mean, you know, a lot of people before this season were lauding the Canadians saying they probably were the most improved team in the league. And that's true. But I mean, this team as, as you know, pretty much constituted a few months ago, wasn't even good enough to be in the, in the traditional playoffs. Like they were out, you know, before they got into the, uh, into the play in round and then got hot against Pittsburgh. So I'm, I, I'm going to have to see a bigger body of work before I'm ready to declare these guys as uh, you know, a team that could do it all. 
Interesting points. And it, it's, you know, it's funny. I, I'm going to turn around one thing you said, Ken, about that division that they play in that doesn't have a dominant team. The thing is, the winner of this division is in the final four. Right. So based on that alone, if the Habs are the best, even in a team, in a division that's wishy-washy, that means they're the favorite in the division to go to the equivalent of, you know, the conference final. And for me, it's like a confirmation bias. I, I was already high in them going into the season. I thought they were really improved. I, I picked them to finish second in this division. So in my mind, I'm seeing what I expected to see. I thought they were going to be a surprisingly good team. And they're leading the league. They average 35.5 shots per game. And they allow 27 and a half, which is top 10 fewest allowed. So they right now, they're out shooting their opponent by eight shots a game on average, which is quite a margin. They're really tilting the ice. They're really deep at forward. And that's what the Anderson to Foley acquisitions were supposed to do. And I think uh, we said already on the podcast, Alexander Romanov has, has sort of changed the face of the defense. And what what's interesting to me, I, I think about this team is not just that it's playing well right now, but that maybe it's positioning itself to behave like a real buyer uh, when we get closer to the trade deadline. We know they were linked to Dubois. They were apparently in on him. And you've got Philip Deneau as a UFA. You've got uh, Thomas Tatar as a UFA. Shea Weber, Carey Price, Jeff Petrie, all those guys are in their 30s. So even though the Habs have this great youth contingent, they sort of have, they're, they're coming to a mini cliff in terms of the, the veteran regime of this team. Some of these guys aren't going to be back. So you could argue that for Mark Bergevin, you know, he's got a chance to push his stack you know, maybe not all in, but maybe make a big bet at the table during these playoffs. And I'm not saying you trade Cole Caulfield, but maybe do you trade, you know, do you make a trade where you trade, where you give up Ryan Paling, something like that. Like one of your secondary prospects to pursue an upgrade. I don't know. I, I could see it. Cause I think if the Habs are going to be missing one thing, as we get closer to the playoffs, it's that, you know, frontline sniper, maybe Caulfield will be someday, but I think they have a lot of really good, you know, guys who on, on most teams would be second liners even Tyler Toffoli he's not a true first liner he's a, he'd be a good second line scorer on a lot of teams despite his hot start uh, but based on just how they played so far and the fact that I think they could be aggressive I, I like them as, as contenders right now uh, a really interesting rumor surfaced this week uh, I think it was Chris Johnson at Sportsnet that reported it and the idea was there's a couple really fascinating ideas here one is that the NHL they're discussing a prospect showcase tournament uh, before the draft, because obviously scouts aren't getting a good chance to look at kids because we have, you know, the WHL, OHL aren't playing games yet. The Q had a really big gap in games as well. Um, so there's that idea. There's also the idea of delaying the one draft class and having two draft classes on back-to-back -back days next June, June 2022, which is crazy to me. So I'm curious. I want to unpack these ideas. Uh, Kenny, we'll start with you. Um, do you like the idea of this prospect tournament do you think it's a good idea and uh what about this this delaying draft thing is this a good idea too i'm curious it's it's a lot to discuss but just uh take a minute and then tell me what you think well as far as the 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 the, the draft tournament um yeah that's something that's been going on for a while i know central scouting danny mart central scouting is is kind of driving the bus on this and and you know i mean <laughs> rightly so i mean do, do we have any like real confidence that there's going to be any season of consequence in junior hockey this year. I, I sure don't. I mean, I know the OHL is planning on, <clears throat> you know, possibly a 24 game season. And I think the WHL has plans to, to start. I mean, the Quebec league went, they, they went into a bubble. Now they're off again. Um, I have, I have zero level of confidence. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, but I, I can't sit here and say, yeah, there's going to be a junior season this year at some point. Um, so yeah, I mean that their, their float, central scouting is floating that because they need views. They need, they need, they need times to see these guys. So yeah, I think that's a good idea. As far as the back-to-back -back draft class, I see, I thought to me, they've been talking about going to a 19 year old draft for years. If you're going to do it, this is the year to do it to, in my opinion. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure you'd be able to do that this year because you know you still have, you'd have to get a, you'd have to get an agreement with the players association to change everything and and all of that. But I I would have thought that there would have been more of a push to move to a 19 year old draft this year because like I said, if there's a year you're going to do that, this is the year to do it. Yeah, and you know what? I almost wonder if this dual draft idea is a sneaky way for the 19. -year draft proponents to say oh well you know if that's silly we'll just go to a 19 year old draft which is what they wanted all along i personally I, I see the arguments for the 19 year old draft i still don't like it for a couple of reasons one is that i think 
the 18 year old draft rewards great scouting and rewards, you know, people that can see, uh, you know, the, the upside and the potential of certain players and, the, you know, they, they get rewarded for it when those players do end up turning into NHL stars. And also I see it as restriction of trade because you will get a couple of kids every year that jump straight to the NHL. All of a sudden you are taking literally almost a million dollars away from them by making them wait a year. So I don't like it for that reason, but I can, I can see them trying to backdoor it through this double draft idea, which for the record, I do not like, and I do not want to delay the draft that much. Going to the first point, I really like the idea of doing that tournament because you know, we are looking in a best case scenario at the OHL and WHL having 24 game seasons. And if you think about some of the players that miss most of their draft year with injuries, you know, like a Morgan Riley, for example, or Alex Galchenyuk, you know, like 24 games, you're, you're basically talking about an entire draft class of injured players when it comes to, you know, the, uh, how much you're going to see them. So it is difficult to get a handle on these kids. Also, Sweden, um, if I'm not mistaken, has canceled the rest of their junior seasons. So those kids, those viewings are all done. Um, what I think you could do, uh, you know, we usually have the draft combine in Buffalo. I think what you do is you set up a draft combine bubble. And what you do is you get all the kids that, you know, played less than a certain amount of games, let's say, and you put them on teams. There is a hotel literally attached to the Harbor Center uh, right across the street from Buffalo's main arena. Um, you put all the kids in that hotel or the other Marriott that's literally across the street from that Marriott. You have them in a bubble. They can play games at Harbor Center. They can play games at the Sabres Arena in front of all the scouts. You know, you do total non-contact. And that's how you do it. You know, the only reason we haven't done on ice testing with players in previous years is because you had some kids from Minnesota high school that hadn't played since March. You had other kids that were a week uh, removed from the Memorial cup final. And it just didn't make sense. You had all these kids at completely different stages of their season. This year, we do not have that problem. You have so many kids that are just sitting around at home training, doing the best they can, uh, but not playing high level games. Everyone's going to be rested, you know, maybe with the exception of kids in Russia that have been playing all year long and, and the USHL and NAHL, which have been playing all year round. Um, so I think what you do is you set up a tournament, you get like, you know, 120 kids um, from OHL, WHL, Sweden. You know, anybody who hasn't played a certain amount of games, toss them all together on teams, and that's how you do your scouting. Hmm. Interesting. I don't think I'm as, I'm as high on the idea as you guys are, just because I think it actually has potential to backfire and create artificial portraits of what players are. And, you know, if you look at this tournament, I get it. You know, we've all talked to scouts who say it's brutal, you know, watching video, and now obviously this year, the there isn't even video to watch because there's going to be so much less footage of guys playing. But if you put these guys in this tournament, it's going to create a situation where they're not playing with the players they normally play with. And it's like, are, are you going to be able to evaluate what a guy brings to a team when he's just thrown with another elite player that he's never played with before? So to me, if this idea is going to work, what I would do is invite actual teams to the tournament. So it's not just, you know, a prospect from the London Knights, you invite the London Knights and you have the London Knights play, you know, the Moosha Warriors or something like that, where so you can actually at least see how a prospect functions with his regular line mates in the system of a team and how he interacts with this. Because so many scouts, they always say they study how a guy interacts with his teammates, what types of penalties he takes, all these like personal elements to a kid's game as well, not just strictly the on ice results, but you're not going to get the whole package unless he's with his usual group. So I think to me, that's the only way it works. And if they're willing to do that, and like it's almost like you make it a super Memorial Cup tournament even if it's exhibition, but, you know, a big field, I think that could be really cool. Um, obviously the only problem would be, you know, there's so many teams. So how do you make that fair? You don't, unless you do multiple bubbles. I think the only way you'd be able to do it is like a Western bubble, you know, or maybe a bubble for each conference or something like that. Right. Even within the leagues um, and the back-to-back -back draft idea. I, what I don't understand is like, how, you know, would you, with the draft order for day one, do it based on this year's standings? 
and the draft order for day two be based on the following season's standings because otherwise you know you can't have you can't have a team lit win the lottery twice and if you did day one based on next year's standings you need to do a lottery for the second for the 2022 draft so i assume you'd have to do it that way where this year's standings still apply and a year later it's based on how you finished in this season for that first day if they did that i guess it could work but I, overall i agree with you ryan uh, that it, there's just a lot to unpack there and i think it's i think it would be unfair to the kids in particular um so you know that's one what we're talking about of course is a ripple effect of COVID. we're also seeing a ripple effect particularly in the central division which is just COVID hotbed you got teams left and right getting wiped out teams missing games you had a, a stars COVID outbreak i know carolina's had problems and so many of these teams are not playing many games at all. The Panthers only played two. And the NHL, they announced the amended schedule to try and correct that, which we expected would happen. Uh, Panthers playing 100, in 103 days, they're going to play 54 games, eight back-to-backs. So I'm curious, you know, do you guys see any silver lining for these teams? Like, could it be galvanizing? Could they get momentum? Or is this just, no matter what, the Central Division is going to be at a big disadvantage for the rest of the season? What do you think, Kenny? I, I think it's a disadvantage. At, at the very least, it's it's a financial disadvantage. I mean, let's take the Tampa Bay Lightning, for example, right? So they play two games against Columbus. They're supposed to play against Carolina. They were supposed to play tonight and Thursday night. So instead of flying from Columbus, from Columbus to Carolina, they end up going back home. Now they've got to fly back to Carolina up for a game Thursday, we presume, if, if it's still on, and it, and it is at this point. So they've got to do that. And then in fe- later in February, they got to go back again to make up for the second game that they missed. That's, that's like $150,000 right there in charter flights and, and, and all the expenses that are associated with that. Um, so at the very least, it's a financial disadvantage. I'm surprised the league didn't have like a, like a travel pool of money this year that you could draw upon or something, you know, because, you know, I mean, look at, look at the Islanders. I mean, they're going to bust to the Devils, the Rangers, probably Philadelphia, maybe Washington. Who knows? Like they're, they're hardly going to travel at all. So I, I think it's a real disadvantage. And I think, you know, especially once you get down to the, you know, down to the grind. And, and I don't know, it to me, it's almost a mental thing too. Even though you have all those games in hand, you look up and you're so far behind the other teams because you haven't played games. I think that does a mental, a, a mental number on teams as well. Even though you know you have those games, now you go into those games and like, now we got to win these games, you know? So that adds pressure. You know, as you say, lots of back-to-backs. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, some, some real grind on these guys. So yeah, I do, I do believe it's a disadvantage. Mm. I will say though, that the saving grace of the divisional format is that, everyone in the central or most teams in the central are, are in the same boat. And as we mentioned earlier, the playoffs, the first two rounds are within your division. So, you know, if we're just talking about the central, there's going to be lots of back-to-backs, but a lot of teams are going to be playing those same back-to-backs. And because it is a 56 game season, it's not as arduous as if you were trying to cram in, games in an 82 game season. Uh, I think what's interesting to me um, is, you know, once you get out of that divisional format, um, if that has any impact, and also if we eventually see straight up cancellations and teams, let's say in the central can't play 56 games, or if only some of them can play 56 games, then does the NHL go by points percentage for the top four playoff spots? Now, this is something that the AHL um, did when they brought in the sort of California division um, because they weren't playing as many games. And, you know, it worked out for the most part. Um, I I have to imagine that's a contingency plan, at least for the NHL. And that'll be interesting to see if, uh, if they need to fall back on. Yeah, for sure. I, I think I'm with you guys. Uh, it does help that they're all in the same division. And, and, you know, in a way, you could say it's good to get this out of the way early because it could ha- happen in another division later in the season, right? Maybe it happens in the Pacific in a month and they're in a worse spot. Uh, but just, I, I do think it's a grueling it's a grueling stretch of schedule. You don't really get to practice. So if your team is slumping, 
you can't really sort it out and with that practice time because you're just getting peppered with game 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 and it also just forces you know whether it's the taxi squad or the backup goalie you're just gonna have to rely on your inferior players so you know for lack of a better word just the, the guys who are not your regular starters are gonna have to come into your lineup a lot more uh, and that could just theoretically weaken your team you know, if, you, if you're always having to if you're having to play your backup goalie far more than you ever wanted to because of these eight back-to-backs it's never a good thing um, you know you never maybe you see some some magic juju with one of these teams where they just get in a rhythm. I think if you're hot, if you're streaking, maybe it's a good thing. If you're healthy and you have momentum and you're playing really well, then you can ride that. And, you know, you got the hot hand, but if it's the other, the other way, if you're struggling, it could be a disaster. And I think your team could go in the tank. So overall, I'd say it's a disadvantage. Uh, so let's do some mailbag questions. I got a few good ones. Uh, this one is from Luke Diamond and Luke says with teams playing each other, more often this year, what kind of differences should we expect to see in the way games are played against them later on in the season? Uh, will it be something like the playoffs where the focus shifts towards locking things down defensively? I think absolutely you're going to see lockdown. And the main thing is you're going to see a playoff style game between these teams. I think even at the halfway point of the season, because the interesting thing about the schedule, which I think is really fun, is that every single game impacts the playoff picture. It's the top four in each division that make the playoffs. So every game is actually going to be directly impacting a team's playoff chances. It's not like a one-off where, you know, you lose to a team in the West and it doesn't really hurt you in the standings. So based on that, I think you're going to see a lot of tighter checking games and a lot of more coaches doing math about, you know, do we need, can we afford to go to overtime in this game? All that kind of stuff is going to come into play because of that very set demarcation line within a division. And you're always playing teams that are affecting your playoff standing. So I do think we're going to see a change in the play. Uh, Ryan, what do you think, sir? I totally agree with you. I think you're going to see, yeah, a lot of sort of locking it down near the end. I also wonder uh, if at the end of the season, particularly in the second half, if we see a lot more fights. Uh, because teams are playing each other so often, you know, if there's a dodgy hit in a regular season, you might say like, oh man, we don't see that guy again until next year. Uh, and then you kind of forget by then. Whereas here it's like, oh man, we don't see him till next week. And then we see him three times. And, you know, we saw, it, uh, you know, with uh, Tyler Myers and Joel Edmonds in the other night uh, where that score got settled right away. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised, especially teams that are out of the hunt when you don't really have anything to play for. I, I, w I, I could see tempers boiling over a lot, uh, especially because it just in general, this is kind of going to be a tense, frustrating season. I could see a lot of Donnie Brooks. Yeah, I actually was going to make that point myself. And, and I was going to make the point about the Joel Edmondson fight with with Tyler Myers. I mean, if there's some breathing room between those two games, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, saner heads prevail or whatever. And, you know, you, if it's Montreal, Vancouver, you might not play them again this year, you know, but, but they play them two nights later. So I, I agree with you on that. I, I actually was kind of surprised that the NHL doesn't, isn't going to approach discipline in a different manner this year. Um, because they do it so well all the time in, in regular seasons, not, um, but, uh, but like to me, you know, like, like I, I thought suspensions might be worth a little more because basically every game is magnified, right? So a one game suspension in a 56 game schedule is different than a one game suspension in an 82 game schedule. And you, you also mentioned that Ryan, like, so, so if there's a borderline hit, that either gets suspended or doesn't get suspended, you know, a lot of times, you know, that guy's not going to have to face that team two nights later. But in this case, like, I mean, what would have happened if something had happened between Anaheim and Vegas in the first game, they had three more games against each other. Right. So uh, yeah, I do see that. I do see that being an absolutely being a factor down the stretch. And I also think that it's going to produce less exciting games because familiarity they're going to be so familiar there's not going to be as much chaos there's not going to be as much unpredictability to all of it i think you know you're, you've super scouted these teams you've played them you've got the you've got you know you've got all kinds of video so i, th I think it's going to really kind of as you say it's going to lock things down but it's going to make for a less uh unpredictable less exciting product i think Mm -hmm. Oh, it's funny. To Ryan's point, familiarity breeds contempt. And to Ken's point, familiarity breeds attrition, I think. And the player safety thing, you know, it's a really good point, Ken. And the other thing about it is, you know, they do 
uh, at the player safety department, they factor in narrative of games, right? So if there's something personal going on, they've been, they've seen the two guys have been jawing at each other all game long. And then a guy gets hit with a, with a questionable hit later in the game, the same guy uh, that, he, that the same two players that were jostling with each other, that stuff matters. So when these teams are playing each other a lot, you know, if somebody drills Tyler Myers in the next meeting between those two teams, they're going to pay a lot more attention to it because there's just so many narrative factors at play. Uh, next question. It's big old goof. Big old goof is back. And I wanted to give big old goof another question because we were pretty tough on big old goof last week, just kind of dumping on him. So, uh, or it could be her because, because it's Devon Genereux is the is actual name of big old goof. So it could be, could be a, a man or woman. I'm not sure. Uh, but big old goof says now that Barkov, uh, Alexander Barkov isn't underrated. Who is the most underrated and underappreciated player salary aside? My vote is Michael Backlund. Uh, for me, it's kind of the better Michael Backlund, which is Philip Deneau. Uh, I think, you know, just territorially, possession-wise, the ice absolutely tilts when he's on the ice. He's playing against elite players all the time. And he also, you know, it, he has tough matchups, kind of like me talking right now with my baby screaming in the background. You, know, you got to battle. You got to battle through it. Uh, and in the playoffs, uh, in, against the Crosby line, that was Deneau's assignment. And I think he did a really good job. Like, he was crucial, I think, in that upset. Uh, so to me, Deneau's the guy, even though obviously in a contract year, there's going to be more buzz around him and maybe he won't be perceived as underrated when he gets his next contract. But I think right now he's my guy. Who do you have, Mr. Kennedy? I'm going to go with Riley Smith in Vegas. You know, this is a player where, you know, obviously Florida shouldn't have given him up. Um, but he has been such a good player for the Golden Knights right from the start. You know, William Carlson obviously got a lot of glory because of his massive goal scoring uh, in that first season. And then Jonathan Marcheseau is a little more flashy, but Riley Smith, you know, he steps it up in the playoffs, 22 points in 20 games when Vegas went to the final that first year. He's always on the right side of the puck. And when the puck goes the other way, he's right there after it. You know, he plays the game the right way. 200 foot guy and you know he just doesn't get a lot of love so i'm gonna go with uh, riley smith well now that Barkov's not the most underrated player in the league i'm gonna go to the other side of the state and go with andre palat uh to me this guy is a guy that's a, he's he's a beast as far as i'm concerned he can play anywhere in your lineup as he's showing right now playing with steven stamkos and braden point um, he can play on your third line he can he's he's, he's another guy that's always on the right side of the puck um, you know, chips in with, with a, a really good amount of offense, plays the game the right way, you know, reminds me of a Marion Hossa, maybe a, a slightly lowercase Marion Hossa, but definitely in that vein. Good. Uh, next question is from Adam Flett. Adam asks, what has to happen for Jeff Blaschel to lose his job? Or is he safe as the wings are going nowhere this season? I tend to believe that Blaschel's safe because there isn't really a point to changing coaches right now. You have so many of your pro top prospects, the Red Wings top guys, as we've said recently in the podcast, they haven't come over yet, you know, Mord Sider and Alexander Raymond. So to me, you know, you do reach that point where a young team decides who the shepherd is going to be, you know, it was Travis Green and for Toronto it was, you know, Mike Babcock, but you have the team that's young and has a lot of potential, but I think you got to wait to the right moment when there's at least potential to start rising. And middle of the season, I don't see it. It's mostly, a, you know, a lot of veterans that Steve Eisenman added that are kind of rental types. The personnel might change as a result because you might see trades in mid-season. So if I'm Eisenman, I'm, I'm waiting till this offseason and I could see this offseason being the time a change comes. And maybe you're looking at someone, you know, if the, for example, if a team like the Penguins underachieves, maybe a Mike Sullivan becomes available, someone like that. And I, th and you see, I think you're hoping that a bigger name uh, suddenly is available this offseason and that's your guy to start kind of shepherding this new group. So I, I don't see a Blasio firing happening when you have a team like this. Like you said, Ken, got pounded by a very bad Chicago team twice. What's the point of changing coaches? What do you think, Ken? Well, I'm actually going to go the other way with that. I, I think there would be a point in changing coaches. And and I mean, you're not going to fire Bla Jeff Blashill and find his replacement. You're going to fire Jeff Blashill. You're going to have a stopgap for the rest of this season. And it, and it sucks because I think Bla Jeff Blashill is a really good coach who could who can do some good things. But I, I mean, I watched some of those games um, this weekend against Chicago, and they're structurally you know, that, that's a, that's a bad team structurally. They make a lot of bad decisions. Their defensive zone coverage is like, I, I want to say abysmal, but that would be like, 
that would be like, you know, insulting teams that are abysmal. Like their, their, <laughs> their defensive zone coverage is is just just biblically bad. Um, and and at some point, I I just wonder if you know you don't say you know that this season's already a pain in the butt for a lot of players. You know they're going to be going nowhere. Like like you just get tired of losing all the time. Like of losing and losing and losing. And I'm not sure if you're Steve Eiserman if you don't look and go. What kind of effect is this having on Dylan Larkin and Tyler Bertuzzi and Anthony Mantha losing all the time and and learning how to lose, you know, and, and being comfortable with losing all the time. So I, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I, I, I can see that if this continues to go south the way it does, it is, I'm not sure they'd have any other choice. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to kind of thread the needle here where I, I agree with Ken, uh, but I also agree with Matt. I think it happens in the offseason, and maybe what they even do is if things get really bad, you fire them and you just have them, you know, an, an assistant coach as the interim, but it's like an obvious interim. Like, this is not our guy in the long term, but we just have to – we have to stop with this particular – coaching voice for now because I think the Red Wings have gotten some experience for a lot of their young guys already and that's key and you know in bringing in guys like Bobby Ryan and, and Sam Gagne um, and even Mark Stahl and a couple of guys in the blue line Troy Stetcher you know they brought in competition for the young guys so they weren't gifted roster spots and obviously Bobby Ryan in particular has been uh, pretty good for them so far and, uh, you know, I, I know, um, you know, Tyler Bertuzzi said, you know, uh, a few nights ago that it, there's a lot more stability on the bench um, just because of some of the, the veterans that have come in. So you're in an OK situation right now, but next year I, I, I would expect the Red Wings to be better. And I think they need a coach to do that now, whether it's a recycled coach. Um, that has been in another NHL market. And I mean, Mike Sullivan would be huge for them if they could get him. Um, I'm also wondering, because Steve Eiserman always zigs when we think he's going to zag, I'm going to throw a name out here, Igor Larionov. Mm. What mm. if they gave him a shot at an NHL bench? You know, the World Juniors didn't go great, but Larionov wants to play creative offensive hockey and given all the weapons that Detroit is amassing, Zadina, Lucas Raymond, you know, Joe Valeno, um, I, and then they're going to get a high pick this year as well. I wonder if you try to start something new and exciting in Detroit that, you know, you've got Larkin's speed, you've got Manta's goal scoring ability. Um, to me, that would be super fun. And maybe it's too much of an experiment for an NHL team that needs to get some winning going, but maybe it's just what the doctor ordered. Mm, that's fun. It's funny when you said Lucas Raymond, I, I, I'm pretty sure I said Alexander Raymond. I think I combined Alexander Holtz and Lucas Raymond into one player because I just associate them with each other so much. I'm, I'm not positive, but I feel like I might've said Alexander Raymond. The Terror Twins. Yeah, the Terror Twins. I just amassed them into one. Uh, we're going to finish it off with the rapid fire game now. I am the rapid fire host. So this week, Ryan, you will be the first answer. Ken, you will be the second answer. If right. you are ready to begin, then we shall start the rapid fire game. Do it. All right. Ryan, who has a better career, Jack Hughes or Alexi Lafreniere? Jack Hughes. Absolutely, unequivocally, Jack Hughes. I think people are bailing on Lafreniere too quickly based on the start. I'm going to say Alexi Lafreniere. Next question, Ryan. What is the first big crowd activity that you want to do when the pandemic is passed, vaccines, all that stuff? Go. Barbecue festival. Ooh, yeah. I want to play hockey. <laughs> I want to play hockey. I want to go back to the rink. I want to have beers with the guys after the game. I want to, <laughs> I want to get this old creaky body on the ice that's what i want to do and i do want to go to the bars i do want the bars to open up again because then it will cut down on my drinking <laughs> nice i i, I want to go to bars too and restaurants travel but my my quickest nerdy answer is 
movie theater. I just want to be in a, I want to see a loud, I want to see Top Gun Maverick. I want to see the new James Bond, Black Widow. I want to see them all in one day or something. Just get them all out of my system. I've been waiting for these movies for like a year, especially Top Gun. Come on. I want to see Top Gun so badly. Uh, next question. Would you rather be a shooting star who doesn't get a cup like Jim Carrey? Everyone remembers you. Okay. Not, not, I'm not, not actor Jim Carrey. I'm talking goalie Jim Carrey. Right. Right. Or a nobody, but you have a cup ring. Let's say like, like Rene Corbet on the avalanche or something. Ryan. Hmm. I think I'd rather have the cup ring because that's why you play the game. And when I own a car dealership, I will have my Stanley Cup ring. I'd be like, you want to wear it? What will it take to get you into this acting? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I think I'd go with the, the latter as well. Uh, only because, not only because, number one, because you get the cup. Number two, because those guys tend to have longer careers. And even though they don't have the big contract, you know, they, they have a lot of little contracts that add up to, then you look and you go, holy smokes, that guy made $17 million during his career. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think I'd go with the lesser light. Yeah, I'm going with that too, because I, I think you get tired of the same expression on people's face when they realize who you are and then they realize what happened to you. So it's like, hey, you're that guy who, uh, you know, had the good season yeah yeah and then they then they realize that your career went in the toilet and it gets awkward i don't want to have to deal with that so i just want to be the guy who had the nice winning career have lots of good stories to tell over the years and yeah andrew hammond that's a that's a perfect one so people are like hey hamburglar yeah you had the one uh good season yeah. steven just just referenced uh, andrew hammond great example uh okay this one there's a, it's a tv spoiler category okay people if you're listening you want you don't want to hear about character deaths just, just fast forward a few minutes, okay? Ryan, which TV character death affected you the most emotionally? Ooh, I mean, I'm gonna go with uh, Rob Stark because totally didn't see it coming. And the, the manner in which it happened was just like so cold blooded. Wow, okay. <laughs> wow, this is a good one. Uh uh jj's dad on good times <laughs> and, and a close second i remember a close second was when the bionic uh when when the bionic woman and the six million dollar man broke up i was really like i was legitimately the 11 year old ken campbell was legitimately <laughs> bummed when they when they, when the two of them broke up yeah I, I was bummed about zach and kelly on saved by the bell my character death that crushed my soul the sopranos Adriana Lacerda just broke my heart. Silvio drove her out to the forest. She thought she was. Yeah, that was tough. Yeah. She realized she was looking at the, the the trees, realizing they're going into the to the forest. She knew. She knew. And she couldn't get out of the car. If Stephen says bleeding comes Murphy. Great one. Okay, Ryan, who is the best deeker of all time? Settle the debate. Ooh, uh, I'll go Pavel Datsuk. I'll go. Uh, you know, uh, Steve Eiserman used to just score the most amazing highlight goals. I'll go with him. My favorite player of all time. I'm going to say Pavel Bure is my, is my all-time deeker. Okay, the last question. <clears throat> I, need to take, I need to clear my throat for this one. Okay. You're given a, a devil-like creature gives you this choice, okay? You can either have only cold, ice-cold showers every single shower for the rest of your life or for an entire year in order to get dinner, you have to score a breakaway goal on Dominic Hasek in his prime. Otherwise, you don't get to eat. So which do you choose? Cold showers for life or one year of score on Hashik for dinner? Ryan. Ice cold showers because I cannot miss a meal. I'm gonna try I'm gonna go with the with the uh, with the Dominic Hashik thing because I think that I think that I could probably cut a deal with him. And and I just I I cannot live without my hot showers. Even in the summertime, I gotta take warm showers. Yeah, I'm going to go with Hashik as well. If, if I really struggle after a while, then I'm just going to start eating really big lunches and breakfasts. And I'm hoping I develop enough of a rapport where Hashik's like, okay, I, I will make the same, but I, I'll, I will sneak you cheeseburger good after we play. I will give you cheeseburger good, okay? Don't tell anyone. So that, that's what I'm hoping for, okay? You asked that question just so you could do your Dominic Hashik. Well, I, I did it actually. And then as I was answering, I was like, oh, wait, this is an opportunity. I better slip it in there. So the opposite. Well, that concludes the rapid fire game. Hope you enjoyed it. And everyone enjoy your hot showers while you got them. Cause you never know when a devil could give you a proposition and we'll be back later on next week to talk more hockey. Thanks for listening and watching.